Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so it's Coffee and Conversation with the uh, Cal Poly CIE um, Small Business Development Center. Our guest this morning is Jeff Bocan. He is a partner at Okapi, Okapi Venture Capital. Um, please feel free throughout the session to ask questions in the Q&A box. We will look at all the questions coming in and we'll make sure to relay them to um, either someone from our team or to Jeff while he gives our presentation, but we'd love this to be as interactive as possible. So please don't hesitate to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we have a very brief video that we'd like to show you from our sponsor, uh, Maynard Cooper, a uh, law firm based in the Bay Area. And here's a message from our sponsor, uh, one of the partners there, um, Jamal, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jamal al Haj, and I'm a partner with Maynard Cooper & Gale in the firm's San Francisco office. Maynard Cooper is a full-service law firm of national reach with over 300 lawyers across 11 offices coast to coast. Our San Francisco practice focuses on advising emerging growth companies and venture capital firms, including with respect to equity management, financings, employment, and intellectual property matters. We are extremely proud to be a Founder Circle sponsor amongst an extraordinary circle of other dedicated philanthropists who recognize the immense value that Cal Poly's Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship bring to the SLO community. We hope that each of you enjoys this upcoming training and workshop and are able to incorporate the knowledge and know-how that will be presented shortly to further help grow, develop, and accelerate your businesses. Unmute. <laughs> uh, so thank you to our sponsor. Uh, great to have everyone on board here this morning. So Jeff, good morning. Thank you for being with us this morning. Yes, good morning. And I'm going to do a really brief introduction, but I'm hoping sure. you'll go into more depth uh, once you start your presentation. Um, so Jeff is a partner with Okapi Venture Capital. Uh, he's been um, a partner for the last uh, just over four years. Um, has it is a very seasoned venture capitalist, uh, sits on the board of numerous startups, uh, one of which is uh, one of our local startups, White Fox Defense Technologies here in San Luis Obispo, uh, after making an investment in that startup. Um, so lots of amazing, uh, an amazing background, but I'm gonna let you jump into it and give us some highlights, Jeff. And uh, Jeff is going to share with us this morning, um, you know, the, the the behind the scenes uh, as to what these venture capitalists are looking for when they make their investment decisions and talk about some, um, uh, maybe some success stories and some, uh, and maybe some failures too, so that we can learn from that. Uh, but Jeff, great to have you with us this morning. And uh, yeah, I'll let you jump right in. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Judy. I really appreciate it. And uh, so I will share my screen here um, in a second and well, right now, and we'll jump into it. There's a brief presentation, but um, as Judy mentioned uh, at the beginning, please feel free to, if when you have questions as they pop up, I'm happy to stop and um, jump right into those and address those. So let me pull this up and uh, get that part going. Okay, can Judy, can you see the screen all right? Okay, great. Um, Excellent. Well, just real quick background on myself. Um, I've been doing venture capital for, um, I guess, going on 17 years. And then I have three years of uh, operating experience kind of wedged in a 20 year window, 17 of which have been venture, three of which has been helping run one of my portfolio companies. And it's a portfolio company or a company that you guys may have um, heard of or used some of the products before, a company called Mofi. They did the, uh, con uh, they were best known for the Mofi Juice Pack, which is a protective case for your phone with a battery built inside it. And uh, they did a lot of kind of portable power products. And uh, I helped grow, or I helped join the team once it got to over hundred million in revenue. And then it was going through a really rapid growth phase uh, where we went from hundred million in revenue to 250 million in about 18 months. And uh, it was kind of crazy times. And I, I joined full-time. I kind of came off the board and helped run the, the two founders run the business. And then we sold it in 2016 to a public company called Zag, which makes screen protectors and Bluetooth keyboards and stuff like that. Um, and then I joined Okapi. I came back to Okapi, um, uh, or not back to, but I came back to the venture side of the table, joining Okapi Ventures after we sold Mophie back on the venture side of the table. 
Um, so I've done a few angel deals along the way as well. And um, yeah, I can, can jump right into our firm. We are a seed stage firm. So we typically are leading the first round of investment that a firm is, um, that, a, that a company is taking on. Um, they, we will lead rounds between one to $4 million in, in terms of the amount of capital that's being raised with us doing anywhere from half a million to 1.5 million of that. Um, we focus mostly on companies here in Southern California. And I actually, we count slow as Southern California. Uh, as Judy mentioned, we did do uh, White Fox Defense. That's our only company up there, but we do kind of look at basically everything that's not the Bay Area, we, we consider. Um, uh, but we do look in other underinvested markets as well. Uh, one of our recent investments was actually in the Midwest, in the Chicago area, um, where I've had some past experience in my venture career in the Midwest. Um, so we will you know, look for opportunities there. And one, I don't know if it's an unusual thing, but um, a lot of seed firms take kind of a spray and pray approach as we call it, where they'll make a lot of small investments in a lot of different companies and typically have a pretty passive role. Um, we don't take that approach. We have kind of this high conviction, high touch approach where we make a smaller number of investments. We take a board seat with every company that we invest into. And we really leverage the experience, like my experience that I mentioned, my two partners have similar depth of experience, 20 plus years in the startup or venture space or, um, or as founders. Uh, and we really put our shoulders behind our businesses and try to help them ensure that they get to the Series A round and hopefully beyond where they can really have the best um, likelihood of success. So that's Okapi. Um, so what I, what I figured we'd talk about is really, as Judy mentioned, a little bit of the process of you know what's going on on the other side when you're pitching a, a venture capitalist and what's happening on the other side and, and what what's going to be your hopefully you're giving you the best chance to succeed in that process um so i think the first and foremost you know it's, it's pretty critical to just ask do, does venture capital make sense for you in your business i mean the venture capital is not for everybody um, there are a lot of businesses that are great businesses but you know either don't require the venture capital or venture capital is not a great fit so some of the things I have here, I mean, you would be a good fit if you have the ability from a business model standpoint in the markets that you're addressing to grow fast. And I would say also the interest that, that you have the personal interest to grow fast. It's, I mean, starting any kind of business is hard work, even if it's going to be kind of a lifestyle business, you start a um, you know, hair salon or whatever, that's not going to grow fast or whatever. Like it's still really hard work doing, getting anything started but it's even harder work to start a business and to grow really fast. Um, it just compounds all the challenges of running a business. So you have to be willing to do it. So it's like, you know, are you addressing a market opportunity where this is even feasible and do you have the interest to do it? And if you don't, venture capital is not for you. Um, and then this last, you know, one of the last parts here is this viable exit path. I mean, the venture capitalists and any, a lot of your investors are gonna want to get their money back out at some point. They'll give you the money up front. And, but they're going to expect after three, five, 10 years, there is going to be a means to get um, liquidity as it's called um, in the space, but to get their money back. Uh, and usually hopefully a, lot, a substantial multiple of that. And a lot of the venture capitalists are targeting to make 10 times their money by the time everything's said or done. Obviously everyone wants to do better, but a lot of people won't invest if they don't see a path to making 10 times. Quick question for you, uh, Jeff, actually two quick questions. Uh, number one, we also talk about the, um, uh, the addressable market. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the kind of the, the range that we hear, it's not even a range, it's just a number. We hear a lot about, okay, you're looking for a billion dollar market, period. Uh, is, that, are you, is that a standard that you adhere to as well? Generally, yes. Um, I mean, I, and really the sub, it, it's... The math behind that is, you know, people assume, all right, any startup's going to be pretty small and not going to get huge market share. So if they're getting five, 10 percent market share in a billion dollar market, they're going to have 50 to 100 million in revenue. And that's the sort of number at which they can you can get a sizable exit. You want to try to you know, if you're selling the business for half a billion to a billion, um, you're going to need revenues in that sort of range to get to that number. So but that's what's driving that. We generally adhere to that. Um, there will be some rare instances and for, well, not all firms are like this, but we will make some exceptions where we feel like, all right, it's a somewhat smaller market, but it's, um, 
there's a chance to get a huge market share in it, just given the nature of the market. Um, if it's like a winner take all situation, we just are doing a deal right now in a in the medical recall market, which is you know, pretty limited. It's, it's medical recall management. You know, it's like if there's a medical device that's faulty, it's like, how do you notify all the hospitals that have these um, devices that, that this is faulty and you wanna pull those back out of the supply chain? Um, right now that's managed all by FedEx and UPS letters. It's all a paper-based process, unbelievably. Um, this is a chance to make it digital uh, or this company that we're investing in called Notosphere is, is digitizing this. And this is kind of a winner take all situation. They need to get all of these suppliers, all the you know, manufacturers of the devices on this platform. And then all the hospitals, the providers on the platform as well. And the, there aren't gonna be multiple platforms here. There's gonna be one. Now this is one that's probably not a billion dollar market, but um, you know, if they have a good chance of getting 60, 70, 80% of the market, it could still be a business that has that hundred million of revenue that gets us still that exit target. So it will be some, uh, um, exceptions, but it, it depends on the dynamics of the business. And then the other question I have, so I always recommend to the stars that we work with when they do their slide deck to uh, about the exit path, um, to identify uh, acquisitions that have happened in the last 12 to 18 months and just to put them on there to, to mm -hmm. um, you know, because that, that provides some vision, right? Like, okay, well, this is happening, it's trending, uh, there's activity in this market. Yeah. Uh, it's exciting. Google, Amazon. You know, I try to, you know, encourage people focus on the big, big guns and and see who are they acquiring right now, and maybe if if you can even find out the dollar amount, that's even better because then there's a real uh, investors can project themselves a little bit. Is that? Do you think that that's a good? I think it's a great suggestion, and you know, all all of us, you know, as humans, we 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 follow, you know, our eyes follow movement and our mind follows movement. You know, if you're walking in a forest and a squirrel goes hopping by, you kind of, without even thinking, you turn your head and look. And what you just talked about, Judy, are the sorts of things that kind of make your head turn and look, or at least your mind. When you see this movement, you see this trend of like, okay, Mark, companies that are addressing this problem are getting acquired. Like I want to, your mind is drawn to going there. You say like, okay, yes, this is a path that uh, makes sense. And so, well, I'll touch on some of that later, but this movement and momentum thing is really important to kind of get across in your pitch um, that there is, is this movement, whether it's revenue growth, whether it's a lot of customers or uh, kind of users that are using your, your app or whatever it might be, but showing that movement in velocity is really key. Um, I'll kind of move along. Um, on this last point, I touched on this a little bit, but you know, does VC make sense for you? It is a long-term relationship. You know, you are kind of be partnering up with you know, new people that, you know, weren't your co-founders, uh, you know, that you're bringing investors to the table. It, it's going to take three, five, 10 years. Um, so these are long-term relationships. Um, and uh, you want to make sure you're aligned with the investors. You know, wh what are you, are your goals with your business, whether it's to, maybe there's a certain amount of you know, money that you want to earn, or there's, you want to solve a problem to a certain degree, or you just want to be doing something for the rest of your life, whatever it is you know, make sure that um, that's aligned with what the investors are wanting out of the same business. Um, that's when I see the biggest problems happening. Maybe the investors have a real short-term goal in mind. They just kind of want to flip the business real quick. And, you know, maybe you as the founder are wanting to, you know, really build out a broad platform and accomplish a lot with the business. Um, that's where there can be a lot of problems. Um, so make sure you get that alignment with the investors. And let's see, where's my mouse? Um, Okay, um, you know, there are reasons to defer fundraising. So maybe venture capital is for you, but you wanna wait a little bit. Um, you know, it, it is, you can pitch too prematurely. I mean, there's obviously, you know, you never get a chance at a second, first impression. Um, second chance, I, I should say on the first impression, but it's like, you know, go, reach to the VCs when you kind of have your act together and in terms of at least what the pitch is. I mean, if you have some real fatal flaws or you, if, if just practice on a friend or anybody, if they ask some basic questions and your real answer is, I don't know, or if you feel like you're kind of fumbling around to come up with answers of why you're doing certain things or what the competition's like, just some basics, you know, how do customers make purchase decisions? You know, some things like that, if you kind of haven't done all your homework, kind of get that figured out first, because this is a very time consuming and distracting process. Uh, to running your business. As I mentioned, running a business is super hard anyway. 
um, you know, adding all these investor pitches to it and a, a extra communication and materials that you need to prepare for it takes a ton of time. Um, and this other point on the big dilution early, if you start too early and you really just have an idea, you know, there's not much there. So even an investor says, yeah, I love this. This is great. Let's do it. The valuation that they're going to put on the business is going to be pretty low because there's not much they're valuing at that point. Um, you know, it's just an idea. You haven't built it. Maybe there's still technology risk. Maybe there's still a customer adoption risk that you haven't proven out yet. So, you know, it's a very high risk proposition and that reflect, that's going to reflect in a low price. So the, you know, as you're raising that money, you're going to be you know, effectively selling a, a large chunk of your business out of the gate. So the longer you can wait, the better. So what I recommend is, you know, try to tap all the non-dilutive sources of funding first. So these are, you know, this is money that's not going to, um, translate into equity that you're selling as when you're bringing in that money. So whether it's grants, uh, whether it's, you know, at, actually, Jeff, um, I, I was going to jump in on that one because mm -hmm. we have a question in the Q and A that asks that exact same question is how, how do VCs uh, feel about funding companies that also are obtaining grant funding? I mean, I, my knee jerk reaction is like, well, yeah, that's awesome. You know, it's free money. <laughs> like, it shouldn't mm -hmm. be a problem, but uh, how do you feel about um, grant funding in general? We, we love it with the caveat that so long as the intellectual property that's being developed isn't somehow encumbered, you know, by taking that grant, you know, so whoever's providing the grant, are they going to have certain intellectual property, you know, rights over your IP that is going to complicate your exit at some point, you know, if it's a university, you know, are they now going to, you know, you're going to have to go to them for approvals on you know, whether you sell the business or not, um, if there's a transfer of ownership of, of the intellectual property, for example. So that's the one thing to be careful about. But otherwise, grant funding is great. The company I just mentioned that we did in, or that I talked about in the, oh, actually, that was before we got on the line. We, we did an investment recently in the Midwest, and um, they were bootstrapped for five plus years and got to nearly $2 million in revenue with, as a software product, all on grant funding. Uh, with a little bit of friends and family money. So, you know, we did the first institutional round after they got pretty far along and they got money from the industry, you know, universities and, and industry groups uh, for the problem area that they're solving. It happens to be in the uh, electric utility space, but we, we like grant funding. It's great. It's great for the entrepreneurs. Um, and then just on this money point, it's like once you start spending the money and, and you bring it on, it is kind of hard to like the the uh, the train kind of leaves the station it's like the snowball rolling down the hill so it's like it, it you do start things start going you hire people and like the burn rate starts to ratchet up and it, it is kind of hard to slow that down so it is um you know i this last point here you know early on you, you are trying to figure a lot of things out and sometimes when people raise a lot of money and they start spending it before they've really figured things out they usually end up wasting a lot of that money whether it's on product features that customers don't care about. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. I, I, there's a lot of things people waste their money on. Uh, marketing, you know, a product before it's that you're, you're actually ready to even engage with customers. There's so many things. So it's okay to start a little bit slow before and get your act together before you're hitting the market. And this last point, you know, the more data and traction that you have about, you know, for your product or business, before you engage with invest, the more likely you are to succeed and the higher valuation that you'll get um, in the process. Yeah. So he, uh, I'll touch real quickly. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so quick question. So, and maybe this is a little too early for this question. Someone is asking if uh, uh, Okapi does uh, safes or convertible notes. I'm guessing neither. I'm guessing it's mm. a price round, but uh, if you want to answer yeah, we that later. Generally, we try to avoid them. Um, we, we do them rarely. Um, we, we, do, we usually lead the kind of seed price round. That's our preference. We have done a couple, um, but they're usually companies that are farther along. So they're almost company, they're companies that are kind of between the series, the seed and A round. Maybe they raised their seed round prematurely or uh, they did raise it, but they didn't accomplish everything. You know, they just, it took them longer to um, get to where they wanted to get to. So where we're coming in on a note at that point, we will do that. Um, actually, with with White Fox, we we came in on a note the first um, in the first check, but it was, you know, the the next round came shortly thereafter. So we saw it almost as like a bridge. We could see that the next round was going to come together, but normally we don't like to do the notes. There are firms that will will do it. Usually, angel investors are most comfortable with the safes. Increasingly, a lot of VC firms aren't doing safes. 
that's a whole nother lecture about safes. They're, they're, they can be really messy uh, to deal with later. And they're easy up front, but then there's all kinds of consequences down the road, which aren't great for the entrepreneurs or the investors. Um, but uh, it's, it's the easiest approach with the angels, easiest, fastest, cheapest with a legal expense, less, you know, least amount of friction. So they can be good early on, but most venture firms don't do them out of the gate. With the exception of some real, the really small seed firms, if they're managing less than $10 million and they're only writing, you know, $200,000 checks, they'll be doing safes. But if you're talking to a firm that's going to invest half a million to a million, they're not going to do a safe. Um, so we um, talked about this a little bit, but, you know, there are some places you can go with for non-dilutive funding. I'll just go through this quickly. You know, there's grants, obviously, there's different um, federal government grants, SBIR, STTR grants, it depends on the problem area that you're solving. There's usually some grant money around it. We talked about sweat equity. I mean, this is just you know, being persuasive, persuasive and getting kind of free help out of your friends, coworkers, you know, people that used to work with in the past. Maybe it's a vendor that if you're successful, you say, look, if this works, I'm going to give you some business down the line, but you get some free, whether it's maybe it's help making a prototype or whatever, things that where you're not having to give out money. And you say, look, if you make me this prototype, I'll, 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 man, you know, I'll do our first production run with you later. You can do those sorts of things. And sometimes you can give options or some um, kind of non-cash. Now, this is options technically are dilutive. That's why I have low dilutive up there. But maybe you can give some options. It's not cash out the door, but um, you can do it that way. Obviously, there's pitch competitions that you can enter. There's the FF and F, the friends, family, and fools. That's, you know, if you're raising low dollar amounts, um, not, not things that are going to, you know, ruin your relationships if your business fails, which, you know, unfortunately a lot of them do. Um, but you could take on some money there to uh, prove things out. There are accelerators. Um, there are a lot of these now that have popped up where, and you want to focus on the ones that actually will write you a check. There, there, I, there's a number of these accelerators that just basically it's, you know, some smart people or some experienced people that are just kind of giving their time and expect a, you know, a lot for that in return. And maybe they provide some office space and some shared services or something. Those can be okay, but um, ideally get taking on someone that's at least putting some skin in the game, even if it's small. Yeah. Unless, unless it's the slow hot house and it's the Cal Poly Center for Innovation Entrepreneurship. <laughs> there you go. Well, I mean, there's yeah, there are some groups where there's some like genuine value add, but yeah, there's a whole range uh, for sure. And the hot house is great. Um, and obviously you can use credit cards for a little bit, uh, but don't go nuts here. This, that is a dangerous one. That's why I put it last. Um, but you know, if you do need five grand or whatever it is to just pay some programmer to get the first iteration going, you know, you can typically take out a credit card and get that done. Um, okay, so it looks like you're getting ready. Um, we kind of covered the longer you wait. So I think start moving forward when you feel like you have a good story to tell about what it is that you're doing, the problem that you're solving, is it compelling? And that you feel like you can really tell the story well and in a compelling way, ideally with some data, some proof points around why you think your business is gonna be successful um, and that you can really demonstrate a firm understanding of the market opportunity and the competitive landscape and a lot of those elements. Uh, and then the last part, and some people forget this one, I, I, that they really are, have a clear ask and they know what they want and, and, and how much they want. You know, I, I deal with a number of entrepreneurs. I've encountered a number of entrepreneurs that, you know, they have number one and two nailed down. They have the great story. They, they know a ton about the market. And they're like, yeah, we just need some money. Well, it's like, well, how much do you need? How are you going to spend it? What's the priority of the money? What, how far are you going to get on, let's say it is a million dollars. What are you going to accomplish with a million dollars? What will, what will you have achieved after a million dollars is spent? How long will that last? Like you need to have some of those things figured out um, and well thought through when you're before you engage with investors because they're going to be asking those things and if you don't know it's going to people are going to see that like you haven't thought this through they don't you know no one wants to back somebody who's making it up as they go I mean even though that's what you are doing as entrepreneurs but like it, people at least want to back a plan and if the plan isn't really and clear and you're Jeff, making it up we recommend a, a, at least a 12 month runway uh, yes. with the funds. So is that, do you agree with that 12 to maybe? Minimum, yeah, 18 months is, I would really go for 18 months if you can, but sometimes you, you, know, you just can't get enough money to do it. Um, and and it's, not, it's not hard and set on time. I mean, really it's more about these milestones for your business. Like what will you have accomplished in that time frame? Maybe it's only eight months and you will have 
have your full product out and you will have secured um, contracts from three major customers. Like if you've proven certain things in a, in a shorter amount of time, that's great. And that you, maybe you're raising your next round earlier. Um, so there's nothing hard and fast about the time frame, but generally, you know, it takes at least a year to make something meaningful happen when you're starting from, you know, the, a, a, the ground level. Um, okay, so what to expect with the actual process. Now you've decided, yes, I want to do venture capital. I'm ready. Now what's going on with the process. So first you need to get the meeting. You know, that, that's, you, know, you, need, you need your audience. Um, so part of that is, you know, you want to, um, you do want to try to identify people who, for whom your product's going to make sense. Um, if you have a healthcare related technology, you know, before you reach out to the investors, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the investors have on their websites quite clearly what they like to invest into, or they list their portfolio of things that they've invested in in the past, which is usually pretty reflective of the things that they like and would do going forward. Um, if you have a healthcare deal and you're looking at a venture firm and they've never done anything in healthcare, like don't, don't waste your time on them. Um, that's an obvious example, but there's maybe more subtle things that you can look at as you go. Um, but there's certain industry verticals that firms like or don't like, um, you know, find the ones that where you're a fit. And then obviously on stage, there's some firms that just won't do early stage. Um, and you, you usually they're pretty clear about when they, what their entry point is or when they would invest. Sometimes they'll have a revenue target or just may say kind of the stage or the size of the amount of capital that you're raising. But you check that out first. I know that sounds really obvious, but I, I could, I, I'd say a third of the emails that I get that are come in cold, people have no idea. They've not looked to, to see what we invest into. So I don't be those people. Um, you're just wasting your time. Um, so this is the real key one. Try to find a warm introduction through some kind of shared contact to whoever it is that you're reaching out to. Um, this is really, really critical. Uh, it's just like with a lot of things in life. What, you know, you are more, whether it's buying a product on Amazon or whatever, you know, you're more apt to do it if a friend kind of recommended it to you, or it was kind of some social proof point that, uh, okay, yes, this kind of rises things to the top of the list of the things that I'm going to look at. Um, and again, this isn't, I put this, you know, this isn't about being clubby or, or chummy with people. Um, you know, if you're, uh, if you have your product and you're trying to reach a customer, you know, you're not going to just blast them cold. Um, or at least you're not going to be probably very successful if that's what you're doing. There is a process at which you want to you know, get a customer's attention and you, you're doing the same thing here with an investor and investors kind of see this as a test. It's like, all right, how, what do they do to get to me? And this is probably what they're going to have to do to win their customers. And are they going about it the right way? And if they are, then this is, that's a good checking a major box that these people can be successful. Um, yes, having a powerful network is helpful and can accelerate things here. But even if you don't have a great network, um, shoot, maybe you're from outside the country and you or lived most of your life outside the country. You did your college overseas or wherever. Maybe you didn't go to college and you don't have this, some of the networks that some other people might have. Technology these days has made it great, whether it's social media. I mean, LinkedIn is just a godsend for entrepreneurs. Um, if you want to try to reach people and see who's connected, you know, leverage that and ask somebody for that warm introduction that is going to move you to the front of the line more than anything else. Um, that's the single best thing you can do. It's hard and it takes time. Um, I mean, I have to do that when we're raising money, the capital that we have to invest in startups doesn't, you know, I don't have a money tree in the backyard. We have to go get investors and I have to do the same thing to get investors for my money. And it's, it's the hardest part, um, but it's also the most important um, on your email. Just make it super short. A couple paragraphs at the most. Um, I think of it as like a really long tweet <laughs> where you just are trying to get someone's attention and you're covering the real core of what it is that you're doing. What's the problem that you're solving? Why are you so the interesting person to solve it? Um, and then include your pitch deck or a one or two page summary. And I'll, I have more on the pitch deck later. Um, and then look, you, there a lot of people aren't going to respond to your first email. So I would, you know, try up to three times to ping people, you know, give, give the people about a week the first time. And after that, maybe, you know, ping on a little bit more accelerated pace after, you know, two, three days. But if it's all within a two week window, if you don't get your attention, if their attention, I would move on. Uh, and then you can, you know, nudge people through your network as well, if you need to. Um, you know, VCs get a lot of the pitch, pitches, so you do want to be persistent. 
um, kind of mentioned that stuff before. And, you know, in, I wrote this slide, I, I did this presentation a while ago, pre-COVID. So I had face-to-face, -face, not so much of that anymore, but you know, take, take, just ask for a 15 or 20 minute Zoom meeting. A lot of people are willing to give those these days. Um, you know, I, I'm at home, like there are a lot of people, a lot of other VCs are at home too. They have a little bit, they have more windows to be pitched. So just take what you can get. You want to just get that first meeting, get out in front of them and you, you're going to want to try to just set the hook and get them interested in learning more. So um, I'll go into the pitch deck and then maybe I'll pause for questions because I'm sure some may come up from here. Um, you know, your pitch deck, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say debate about this, but people have different viewpoints. I try to keep it like 10 to 20 slides, but it's not hard and fast. I mean, you, you ultimately need to tell your story, um, but try to keep it under 20 um, and don't have it be too wordy. You're not trying to um, you know, close the deal with this deck. You just wanna get people interested to take time to talk with you on a Zoom uh, or in person. So you wanna explain the big idea, why you're gonna be successful doing it and just you know, get them Get the audience to want to learn more. Um, I have a number of, I just have talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who are just put a huge amount of emphasis uh, on the deck and feel like they got to get everything in there. You, you don't like just get your top three to five you know, messages across in that deck of why, you know, why you're going to be so successful. And I kind of break out kind of the top 10 items you generally want to cover, but there should be like, you know, these three to five themes that you want to just nail in that deck. And, you know, these, 10 items will do that. Um, so, I mean, first of all, this is kind of obvious, but like, you know, what, what's the big idea? What, what, are, what are you trying to solve? Make that, bring that right away. I mean, when people open, decide to actually op open the attachment, you've got the, the best, um, the most attention that you have is like, you know, you have 30 to 45 seconds of when people are really focused and they're kind of making their mind up whether they want to invest any more time into reading the rest of your deck. So you have to get your best messaging up front. Don't save it. You know, it's not like a mystery novel where you're going to like save the, the, the drama for the end. A lot of people may not make it to the end. So you have to pull your best points up to the front. Um, you know, you, you want to, you can cover your team introduction. You know, as a startup, sometimes the, the farther you are along with your business, you can actually put the team towards the back. But if you don't have a product yet, if you haven't really done much, maybe the, your single best selling point is you and your team and your experience. You may need to pull that forward. But you can act, you can pull that forward. The, the order of this isn't essential. I'm just it's kind of a list of, of things you do want to cover. It, the order can vary. Um, I mean, normally it's like what's the problem, what's the solution, and why now are kind of like the three one two three, and then team can come later. But um, so yeah, you want to make the problem really clear. And let's talk about your solution. You know, why is what you're doing unique? why hasn't someone solved this problem yet? Um, you know, why you, what, why, why has it come down to this? Uh, you know, you're coming to save the day. Why has the world had to wait for you to, to get to this point? And then what I would really nail is, it's kind of goes to why does it matter? You know, yes, you have your solution, but like, is your solution like a small benefit or is it a really big difference? You know, are you saving costs by three to five times? Are you enabling people to do something 10 times faster? Are you know, like what, why, what is the outcome of people using your solution? Um, making that really clear up front as part of your solution. That's the, you know, why does this matter? And you know, that, that can get people, people's attention. And it needs to usually be pretty substantial improvement to whatever problem is that's being solved. You know, if it's a, 10% improvement or like small incremental improvements or people are only saving a little bit of money, you know, that's not, it's not going to get much attention. Um, but if people see really large savings um, it, where they can increase their capacity, there's a lot of kind of general value props that can be nailed. And if people see that's compelling, um, they'll want to learn more. And that's probably the most important part of your deck is making that part clear. This why now, this is important. And this goes to that movement point I talked about earlier where people's eyes are kind of drawn towards movement. Um, you know, why is this problem going to be solved now? Like, are there some market dynamics, whether it's, you know, the availability of computing technology is such that, you know, some of these problems, whether, you know, maybe there's some data analytics that, that used to require, used to take a really long time to do, uh, or it was very expensive to do with, 
the amount of computing power that was required. Maybe now that's much cheaper. It can be done much more efficiently and it has enabled something new. Um, there could be a platform that has emerged. Um, we've done things in the Shopify ecosystem recently. Shopify is a company that you know, in the e-commerce space to help company get their websites up and running. And um, it's created this whole ecosystem and the e-commerce space that's helped accelerate growth there. Maybe there's some dynamics about what's happening in the Shopify. You know, you have a big platform that's getting adopted like, like Shopify that has kind of opened up these new opportunities uh, and accelerated things. Whatever it be, maybe it's COVID that is driving, you know, that has created some tailwinds for your solution. I mean, we're, we're obviously doing a Zoom here. Zoom Zoom is like the ultimate example of that, uh, of how things got transformed by an external force. You know, maybe there are some external forces that uh, are, are creating the demand or um, environment where it's likely that people are gonna wanna change their behavior and adopt your solution. Um, you, you do wanna to touch on the business model. People wanna know how are you gonna make money? So um, you don't need to go, uh, this can be one, this should be just one slide. It can, hopefully is very simple and not complicated, um, but you'll want to make that clear in terms of um, you know, how you will make money. What's it gonna to cost to acquire a customer? You know, how, how do you reach customers? Um, and getting a sense of what's gonna to cost to kind of win a customer. Um, and then you know, how you will monetize them, not only upfront, but then ideally over the lifetime of that relationship. Um, the competitive landscape, I, I think you need to touch on this. I mean, there's always a comp, there's always competition for whatever it is you're doing. It's one of my biggest turnoffs when I'm doing a, uh, hearing a pitch is when I ask about the competition and, and I hear it every, multiple times every week. And people say, oh, well, we don't have any competitors, which is, ne it's always false. You always have competitors. There's even the, there's the, you know, sometimes the competition is just people doing nothing just not changing, deciding to stick with whatever it is that they've done. Um, just saying no, you know, because there's some compelling reason of why they may say no. Um, but usually there's some either direct competitor or indirect competitor, or, or if you're just fighting inertia, people not wanting to change. But make it, you know, outline that and make it clear of, of you know, what are you kind of up against in terms of getting the attention of winning customers. And normally there's like a competitive grid that people will do you know, there are three competitors, this is how we're different. But, you know, if it's more nuanced than that, but that's fine, you can describe that, but at least show that you've thought about it. Um, you should include a simple revenue projection. Um, some people go back and forth on this. Some people wanna show really detailed financials. If you're an early stage business, if you're even pre-revenue uh, or your revenue is really tiny, I wouldn't just show the rev, I'm fine for that first deck, just show the revenue. And, but show it three to five years out. What you do want to demonstrate is that you do have a business that has the potential to grow quickly out of the gate. And it's not gonna be something that's growing like 10%, 20% a year. And people wanna see businesses growing 100, 200, 300% per year for the first couple of years. They're gonna to wanna to see that. So just show that revenue um, projection. Um, don't worry about the detailed financials. And one point, so I'll come back on, on the business model, I didn't include this on this deck, but you do want to include the unit economics. If you're selling a physical product, um, I talked about um, on the software side, what's going to cost to acquire a customer, which, um, and then what's the lifetime value. Those are kind of software metrics of unit economics. If you're selling a physical product, um, you do show the unit economics. You know, what are your gross margins of the product that you um, will be selling? Um, I think that's going to be an important piece, you know, in terms of so what's it going to cost to actually sell the product? Are you going to have to pay someone a commission? Is it through a third party that's going to take 20%? Are you selling it in a retail channels that are going to take their margin? You know, but kind of back out what it is that you're going to make um, on each deal or on, sorry, on your sales. Um, nine, and this is probably the second most important. So number one is this number four there, the solution. Why is it unique? The key value propositions, nailing that. I think this number nine is, is the next, this is, this is the closing. You want to close with, have this towards the close, but you do want to pull some of this up front if you do have some genuine traction. I mentioned you want to lead with your best, your strongest points first. Um, you know, if, if you do, if you have launched a product and you do have 5,000 people using it and that's grown from 500 to 5,000 in the last eight weeks, like put those points up, like that's real traction. I, I would show that up front. 
anything that you can have where there's some real validation from the customers that they're interested in, in the problem that they're interested in your solution. It's validating that, yes, this is a problem that needs to be solved and that they can adopt your product that, you know, they're willing to sign up for it or whatever um, kind of go to market path is that you have. However, you're kind of acquiring those customers is starting to work. That's really helpful. If you don't have that traction and the customer validation, but your team has kind of done it before, maybe in a similar vertical, or you came out of that industry and you know that problem area really well, and you understand the customer needs and how they make purchase decisions, that's another reason of why something might work. And really um, nailing that in your deck is important. And then lastly, I touched on this earlier, but you know, do have the ask in your deck. How much are you raising? How much, um, how long will it last you? What's the sort of runway that you expect? Where do you expect to get to by the time you've hit the end of that runway? Um, you know, what are you spending the money on? I think that's really important. Things not to include in this ask, and a lot of people do, is the, the value. If you're pitching a VC, if you're doing it to angel investors, that's different. But if you're pitching a VC, don't include the pricing or the terms. VCs are going to want to set those themselves. And sometimes, look, sometimes it's one of these things, if you put your terms out there, you're, maybe you're underselling yourself and the VCs are actually willing to pay more. So you've cut that option off. Or you have it way too high and the VCs see it. And, you know, because I'm seeing deals all the time. I have a really good sense of pricing for where companies are um, and how they could be valued. And if you're saying what I see is something that would be 5 million and you're saying, oh, this is $30 million. I know that you kind of have no touch with reality and that this is going to be a conversation not worth having. So I'll just end it there. So you're best off just not putting anything on pricing in there. In your deck. That's great. You, you've answered kind of, we had a question in the Q&A, uh, Jeff, like, you know, someone was asking, how do you put evaluation on the company? Um, and yeah, so you, you, you've answered that question. It's, it's a discussion and negotiation, but um, I mean, how do those discussions go? Because sometimes uh, VCs, I mean, uh, do they want the startup to anchor somewhere or will, are they willing to anchor first on, on a starting point? I mean, it's a tough one. And, and that's, mm-hmm. that's the question that always comes up. I know. I just had this conversation with one of my portfolio companies yesterday. Um, they have an investor coming in and he said, Hey, how should I talk about valuation? And I, you know, I, I was encouraging him to deflect it as much as possible and kind of put it back to them. And in that case, I said, look, tell him uh, the investor, you know, that we've raised 2 million to date, talk about your accomplishments. You know, there, there are some points and once you throw out the number of 2 million or whatever it is that, you know, any of you have raised, if you've raised half a million, whatever it is, that's kind of setting a, a floor of like, all right, the valuation isn't going to be lower than that um, unless you've totally screwed everything up and you're completely starting over and all that money that you previously raised was kind of wasted. But if you're, um, if, if you're not on that path and you're making progress, um, I would provide some of those details about, you know, what capital you've raised. You can put some of, and I I think simply just saying our value, we're realistic about our valuation. You know, we're familiar with the market and we're realistic about it. I think that's, that's my summary answer for what I tell people to say, but I I really try to have entrepreneurs not give any pricing as much as possible. But look, if you're dealing with someone that's not very sophisticated and they, or or it's angel investors who just don't, they, they don't know how to, they're uncomfortable doing it. They don't want to draft a term sheet and it will be on you to do the pricing. And in that case, you know, most seed companies, early stage companies are valued between three and 10 million. And that range is, is based on kind of how far you are along with your product. Um, the farther along you are with the customer proof points, maybe some revenue, the higher you're going to be on that range. Um, and then typically, I think I have this in this a slide later. Um, well, I'll kind of come to it. Well, I'll touch back on that point later, but I mean, typically you're going to give up between 20 and 33% of your equity when, when on your first raise. So you can kind of back into your pricing from there. If you're going to raise a million dollars, you know, your pre-money is going to probably be three to 5 million, maybe a little bit more. Um, but that's the kind of range. So what are the VC? I, I'll be mindful of time here. I'll go through some of this quickly. Um, here's the, some of the things that the VCs love. Um, so they want it. We talked about this Judy asked earlier about the markets. Um, you know, people do want the large, either a large market or one that's growing really fast, ideally both. 
but um, sometimes it may be a new market. So like White Fox Defense, you know, that market was kind of nascent. It was a counter drone market. Um, it was a kind of non-existent market when we invested, but it's one that where we see really rapid growth happening given the explosion of um, the use of drones, the potential problems that they may have going forward. Um, so we feel like it's inevitable that we'll be a big market someday. Um, people really like a differentiated solution. Uh, so, um, you know, it's really specific to your business, but if you feel like you're coming at something with a really either unique angle, the product's really great, or it's so much cheaper, um, whatever it may be, something that's really transformative, ideally like three to 10 times more transformative, that's a big deal. We talked about customer traction. The more you have here, the better. Um, attractive unit economics where there are high margins. Um, so software has really high margins typically. And if it's something that can be sold and adopted really easily, that's great. If you have a hardware product with really high margins, that's great too. And ideally, you know, the team can be your seller here too. I mean, this, a lot of people won't move forward unless they love the team entirely. And um, if I, there can be a single entrepreneur, that's great. That's the one thing. Ideally, you have a couple people that are really strong as part of your team. And if you've worked together previously, that kind of de-risks things because startups are really stressful and hard and a lot of management, you know, startup teams kind of break up um, and get divorced, so to speak, along the way. And if you've worked together before and have an existing relate pre-existing relationship, that's a help. The process, I won't go into much detail here because um, it's a mess. It's an eye chart. You'll get this slide later, but this is kind of the process. Um, I, I won't even really talk to it. it. You can kind of, a lot of people can follow this directly, but it's kind of the sequence of what, what will be done. The important part here is, is like, it normally takes 30 to 90 days to get to a term sheet. And then it closes typically a couple of weeks, you know, three to four weeks after that. Um, it just depends on how much diligence they're doing. There, there, there are huge exceptions to this. And some people will move to a term sheet in days. Um, that's certainly possible. It's just not typical. And, but even if they are doing it in days, it's this process, largely speaking, but just compressed. They normally are, are doing all of these things, but it may just happen in a week. So if you do get a term sheet, um, you know, here's things to do. I, I, you know, use a lawyer that has worked on a venture capital deal before. You know, the, the venture space is, is, is uh, it's kind of nuanced, but things are very standard. But for lawyers that haven't looked at some of these, what are now standard venture terms before, may make a big deal about certain things that um, and just because they don't understand and that can create some friction in your process and that wouldn't be good or and just distract you kind of get you spun up on things that you think are really important and they're not uh, or they're just completely non-negotiable uh, and that have you wasting uh, energy or goodwill on a, a battle that you're never going to win um, this point is important here and don't be too eager so you get a term sheet and these term sheets will typically have like a, a short deadline to it you know like three days for you to make a decision, yes or no. Um, you, those are usually pretty flexible, um, number one. And two, like, don't be too eager just to sign it right away. Most VCs, they put forth a term sheet and there, there are some things they're gonna be willing to move on. It may be the pricing. It may be some, the way the board is constructed. There are gonna be some things in there around what they call consent rights. What the, you know, what you can do while you're running the business that don't, that do or don't require the consent of the board or, uh, or the VC investor then explicitly, um, those can be negotiated. There's a bunch that can be negotiated in there. You know, I don't just sign on the dotted line. You know, you can push back on something um, for sure. Get, get some of those wins. Um, don't share your term sheet. So if you're talking to a number of investors and you get a term sheet from one, don't share that term sheet with the other people you're talking to until you've actually signed the term sheet. Um, you know, it may, pr there's two things that can happen. One, it just may, you know, maybe one of those investors was going to put forth their own term sheet and now they kind of know the pricing and know the terms and, um, maybe they were going to offer a much better deal. And now they know, oh, we just need to be like a tiny bit better to, to win this deal or worse. And this is the big reason not to, the investors will collude and, They'll kind of, I mean, because it's a small community. You know, I know a lot of other VCs. You may, they may say, "Look, you know, we're in on that deal, but you know, only if you, you know, don't move on pricing, or 
it kind of can get people ganged up against you. So you're kind of better off with the divide and conquer approach until you have it signed and worked out the best deal possible for yourself. And then I talk about picking your battles here. There are a lot of things to negotiate on. If you are using the experience later, a lawyer here, look to their guidance on this. Um, but pick your battles. You know, you're not going to win them all, um, but you can win some. And just you know, ideally choose the ones that matter most to you and that you think you can win on. Um, here, I talk about what to expect. You know, you're going to get that kind of 20 to 35% dilution for whatever it is that you're raising in your round, unless you're raising a really tiny amount of money. Um, there are these consent rights. This, there's a whole separate thing on this, but you know, there are some, it's effectively minority shareholder protections, but you know, there's some protections to the investors that you're not going to get a million bucks and like go buy a Ferrari and open a Starbucks and do all these other things that like aren't your core business. Um, so a lot of those things are in there. So expect them. There are going to be some of those things on how you run and operate the business. Um, investors are going to want to see an option pool for your employees, at least 10 to 20% available for future employees. So this is unallocated options. So you and your founders have a lot. The investors have a, a small, that 20%. And then there's got to be 10 to 20% for people who aren't there yet. It's going to be your future employees, but Investors are going to want to see that because obviously you're going to be growing. You're going to need to hire more people and investors don't want to get diluted later to you, for you to create an option pool after the fact um, when you're hiring people. And then, you know, you are, there is going to be a board. There's going to be some governance. You're going, to, you're going to be accountable to some people in a way that you haven't before. Okay. So I'll just kind of leave it there. Um, stop sharing and uh, come back. But if there's any questions that, you guys have or for further discussion i'm happy to jump in thanks jeff thanks so much it's uh it's it's so great to hear it straight from the from the expert um and you know we have so many debates and conversations and discussions about trying to figure out um how to best prep for this process so thank you so much that was incredibly helpful um i'm gonna put it back out to some um q a uh, I know we, I shared along the way, so those are, you know, we've dealt with those questions, but if there are any other questions, now's a good time. Um, so feel free to jump in, anyone. And while people are thinking about that, I'll touch on the valuation point, because this is, yeah, thank you. It, it's the hardest one. I didn't really know that earlier. Um, so there's kind of a couple ways the investors will do it. I mentioned earlier, the investors are going to want to make at least 10 times their money on your investment. That's going to be their target. So they're going to almost kind of back into the valuation, they'll, they'll triangulate. They'll use a number of different approaches. And one of them, one of the trying, one of the points of the triangle is backing into the valuation. So they'll think, what can this be sold for? You know, if this company does really well, what's the exit going to be? And what are we going to have to own of the business to achieve our 10, 20 times goal um, in that really good outcome? And start doing the math backwards. And then, you know, so what, what percentage of the company do we need? If, let's say it sold for a billion dollars. If we own 10% of it, that's a hundred million for us. That's a, that's a lot. However, uh, and then you say, okay, well, we need to own 10% of the business. So that was the billion to a hundred million. So a hundred million is 10% of the, of the, um, of the billion. And then that would, you know, if you are doing the pricing that infers like, okay, we need to enter at a 10 million valuation up front if we're going to, well, sorry, I'm throwing a lot of numbers out there. That's quite confusing, um, but they'll back into it. But my point that I wanted to make was there's going to be dilution along the way. So you don't get to a billion dollar outcome by just doing your first seed round, almost never. You know, there's going to be other, you're going to raise more money along the way. So if, if I, as the investor own 10% on day one, I'm not going to own 10% on the exit. So they will factor in a substantial amount of dilution, you may call it at least 50% along the way if you're going to get to that billion dollar outcome. So then now they're doing the math on a smaller percentage to, to kind of get to their end goals. But so they'll back into that, they kind of do that backwards math thinking, all right, what is, you know, what's the, um, the maximum that we would invest into? So in this best outcome scenario uh, for us to do 10 to 20 times our money. Um, and I, I say 10, normally it's 10 X, but like if it's, if you're modeling off of like the billion dollar outcome, which is rare, you're going to want to do it 20 times on a billion dollar outcome. Um, so people will back into it. Then there's the market comparables. I mean, we just, we're doing deals all the time. I mean, so I know like I, we've done 20 deals in the last 
three and a half years. And I know the pre-money pricing of all of those companies. Uh, they're all seed stage. So I know have a good you know, sense of, of where things are based on their revenue, how far they are along. And not only my deals, but there are a lot of deals I didn't do where I also know the pricing. So we just have a lot of market data points. So we use those as a reference. That's the second point of the triangle. Um, and then the third is kind of the black box one. It's just the negotiation. There's kind of that dynamic of how much capital has already been raised, um, you know, how far along is, are things with the business? How hard is it to replicate what has been built already? You know, kind of putting that soft value around it and doing all three of those things, you can kind of come to a, a, a price. Nope, I can't hear you, Judy. Sorry, Sorry about that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here in the Q and A. Um, so let's see, uh, one from Johnny. Um, some tech platforms have potential in many markets, uh, but have yet to gain traction in these other markets. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm just gonna read it. Uh, any tips for properly emphasizing growth and expansion potential for other verticals without being too vaporous about it? Um, any tips on what kind of expansion potential adds to the company and cautions when pitching this? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, and you touched on this a little bit at the outset, Judy, of showing like other exits that happened um, before in a similar space. So even I think using analogies to market. So if there's a vertical that you're going after that hasn't evolved yet, and it's in its earliest phases, but its growth trajectory and a lot of the dynamics of that market are similar to things that have already happened. You can show that, um, you know, look, so, yeah, there are a lot of industries that, you know, are still, I talked about our medical recall business, which is just kind of digitizing for the first time. There are a lot of industries that maybe haven't gone digital yet, or they haven't moved to the cloud or to certain mobile platforms. But a lot of other industries, of course, have. So you can show like, look, this is what happens when a large industry adopts cloud computing or whatever that shift is. And it's happened over here in the insurance market. Now it's going to happen here in whatever, the education market or where, wherever it may be, but you can show those sorts of analogies and that can be a help. Thank you, thanks, Jeff. And then we have another question from Sydney real quick. And I think this will be our last question before we wrap up. Uh, she struggles with what to keep confidential in the pitch deck, uh, mm. what to share uh, and what not to share with when talking to VCs. So we know that the VCs won't sign the you know, NDAs and whatnot right. ahead of time. So that's a given. Um, so how do you showcase value uh, without giving away too much? Yeah, well, I think um, that's a fair point. And I think you show enough to get people curious and then to, and then describe, you know, be in the position where you can talk about, to those more sensitive things in person verbally, because these decks do get shared around, you know, once you put it out there, who knows where it goes. So yes, you need to be cautious uh, about that. Um, but you also need to be, I mean, I, I've had a lot of conversations as end with entrepreneurs who are kind of unwilling to kind of really engage or talk about what they're doing. And I'm thinking, look, look, if you aren't willing to talk to me about it, how are you talking to someone in your supply chain, other technology partners? Like you're not going to operate in this vacuum with this secret forever. Like you need to engage other people at some point. And if you haven't figured out a way to talk about what you're doing, where you can kind of move forward with people, but yet still kind of protect the secret sauce forget it. Like you're not going anywhere. So you can't engage with investors because you haven't figured out how to talk about things. You, you, you have to, you know, wh whatever it is, uh, being able to address points in a way that gets people curious and at least has them comprehend without fully understanding. Um, I, I, that's enough, but you need to, you need to at least figure out that. Um, so you, in your pitch you deck, you recommend like maybe not putting the info in the deck, but saying in, in the body of your email, you know, we will share details, you know, verbally, we will verbally share details about our margins, about our, you know, um, whatever it is, the items yeah. that, that the, the startup, the founder deems somewhat confidential. Yeah, so uh, we can follow, this will be addressed in, in the meeting. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of goes to my point. You're not trying to convince, you're not closing the deal with the deck. So don't include, you know, the, the really sensitive stuff in the deck. You're just trying to get someone interested. So if you just make as a statement, we solve this problem because of our brilliant technology. Mm -hmm. um, we can, you know, details to be discussed later. That should be fine. And then people are like, all right, I'm going to get, take it as a given that they know how to do this or that they figured it out. And then I'll have to learn more later, but you, you don't have to lay out the exact process or, 
you know, again, the secret recipe in mm -hmm. your deck at all. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. That's amazing, helpful tips, Jeff. This is super helpful because these are questions that we go over all the time. Um, so th this was this was fantastic. Uh, so we're going to wrap up. It's 9.32. Um, thank you so much for making the time. We really, yeah. really appreciate having you with us, Jeff. Um, uh, and I'm sure, you know, we're looking forward to be able to share some decks with you as our companies right. grow and, and get to that stage. I'm, I'm excited Please do so. to, to work together in the new future. So thank you so much. Cool. Uh, All right. Thanks so much. Yep. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we'll see you again real soon, I hope. So just to wrap up with, uh, with everyone here, our next Coffee and Conversation is January 13. Um, it's going to be awesome. Please don't miss it. Simon Arkell and Steele... Ayert, Ayert, I'm not sure how to say his last name, sorry about that, uh, but I know Simon really well, uh, and he's just, uh, I mean, <laughs> if he hadn't been a very successful startup founder, he should have been a stand-up comedian, he's a really entertaining guy, so even just for that, you, have, you can't miss it, um, and if you have any questions for us, uh, you know, about your business, any needs, any resources that you might want, um, please don't hesitate to contact us, sbdc at gmail.com. Uh, the registration link for the Coffee and Conversation in January is in the chat box as well, so feel free to sign up right now so you're ready to go for after the holidays. Um, so everyone have a wonderful, happy holiday season. Uh, it's going to be probably more quiet than usual for most, but um, uh, take some time for yourselves to reboot for 2021. <laughs> uh, 2021 hopefully will be um, different from 2020. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jeff, and uh, looking forward to connecting again soon. All right. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Amen to the